Hi, my name's Laura Bates, and um, I run the Everyday Sexism Project, which, for anybody who doesn't know what it is, is a very simple website that collects people's experiences of daily gender imbalance, of anything on the spectrum, from the more minor incidents that we're often told to brush off and not make a fuss about, all the way through workplace discrimination, sexual harassment, to sexual assault, and even rape. I set the project up just under two years ago, and we've now received 50,000 entries from women of all walks of life all over the world. But one thing really shocked me and took me aback about the entries that started to flood in in the first months of the project. And it's interesting because people often ask, you know, what were the most shocking entries? And I think they expect me to reply that they were the most serious ones, the most harrowing stories. And of course, those were awful and distressing to read. But the thing that really shocked me the most was the number of entries that we received from really young women, from little girls, from university students. It just wasn't something that I anticipated. And it's some of those stories that I want to talk about today and to share some of them with you today, particularly because we're here in a beautiful university city and because just so many of the entries that we've received are suggesting that there is a real problem at UK universities. I want to take you through some of the things that we've heard about, some of the things that are being reported to us over and over and over again. So this all really started, and I kind of first noticed a real spike in activity to the website the first time that Freshers' Week came around. So the first year that the website had been launched in April, and suddenly when we hit Freshers' Week, I noticed that there was a massive surge in entries to the project. And I remember it started, I remember really vividly, with one email. And it came from a girl who was about to start studying physics at a very highly respected London university. And she forwarded me, forwarded me an email that she'd received from the Physics Society at her university. And the email said, fresh as lunch. This will be mainly a chance for you to scope out who's in your department and stake your claim early on the one in five girls. She wrote that she was going into an incredibly male-dominated area already. And so here, the boys in her year, her male peers, were being sent the message from a university-affiliated society, no less, to view their female peers, who were in the minority in this particular course very much, as sexual prey. And this was really just the beginning. And so many messages and stories started coming in. And often they were about Freshers' Week and events that were going on in Freshers' Week. So I actually started having a look at the events that were scheduled at UK universities that year. Um, as you can see behind me, these were just a few of the events that I found. Slag and drag, tarts and vicars, pimps and hoes, golf pros and tennis hoes, CEOs and corporate hoes, rappers and slappers, geeks and sluts. And at almost every event, the title sends the message, usually at events that were sponsored by or in association with the universities that these students were studying at, that men are CEOs, pros, geeks. They're powerful, they're talented, they're intelligent, whilst women were being valued again and again by their sexualization alone. And the messages we received were suggesting that this created a really serious sense of pressure for young women to dress in a certain way. And it's important to say at this point that this was not about a kind of prudish morality ban. It wasn't about saying women shouldn't dress in that way if they wanted to. But why should it be a requirement? It felt like fancy dress for the boys meant something fun, meant dressing up in a whole variety of different ways. But every time for the girls, there was a very, very clear, very narrow requirement of how they were expected to dress. And it started to feel like it was about more than just a bit of fun and more like a kind of sexual pressure. And this idea of sexual pressure was really backed up by a lot of the stories that we received about initiations and Freshers' Week rituals. And again, obviously, this is something that if people want to do, they can. And, you know, if it's a free choice and if people are choosing to kind of carry out things and you talk about things being a bit of fun. But many of the reports that we received made it all sound quite militant. And the idea of freedom of choice is quite complex within this unique situation where for most students, it was their first week of university. For many of them, it was the first time living away from home. They were anxious to fit in. They were keen to make new friends. And it was very difficult to be the person standing up and saying no. One girl wrote to us in a project entry, one of the freshest events organized by our halls of residence was a girls and guys pub crawl. We were split into one group of girls and one of guys, and each group went off on different pub crawl routes. All the girls were encouraged to wear pink and dress slutty. We had to come up with a slut name which the older students encouraged us to write across our breasts. 
Upon arriving at each bar, one of the older students would shout out a word which was code for us to either flash our tits or our arse or dance in a seductive way in front of the men in the pub. I didn't take part in this and didn't want to adopt a slut name. I was told I was being too uptight and not getting into the spirit of Freshers' Week. The whole thing culminated in the girls and guys meeting up in the student union, where we were informed that the older students had organised a competition with prizes. One prize was for the slut who collected the most ties from the guys. The other was for the lad who collected the most bras from the sluts. I walked out on a scene of groups of drunk male students forcefully taking off female students' bras. Another entry said, I went out for the freshers' night of one of the women's sports clubs. Our group bumped into the men's rugby club in a bar. They were putting their freshers through their initiation ceremony. All the rugby freshers had their trousers around their ankles and were standing in their boxes. They were encouraged to pick one of us to grind with them. One guy grabbed me, pulled me on the dance floor, and then told me I had to grind on him or else he'd have to do a forfeit. When I refused, he told me I was frigid and grabbed a different fresher. On the one hand, I felt ashamed and embarrassed that I felt too uncomfortable to partake fully in what was considered to be the fun of Freshers' Week. On the other, I was kind of ashamed that I'd taken part in it at all. It ruined my Freshers' Week and left me feeling isolated and humiliated. Another student said it's very different for people who feel shy or uncomfortable. You don't have a choice. There were strict initiations and you just had to do what they said or you missed out. Another said one of the social initiations within the first month of uni was to down a bottle of beer that a man was holding in his crotch. I didn't even realise what we were going to do as we were facing the other way when they suddenly shouted, down it, bitch. It was awful, but I felt like such a wet blanket with everyone cheering on. Another, we had an event as part of Freshers' Week where some of our friends went on stage. A long line of girls was lined up and they had to take all their clothes off. They were told to race to strip. Then there were competitions where you had to do various sex positions. They make it all out as a great thing, but you get pushed into it, and it's not a matter of choice. And these weren't isolated incidents. This isn't cherry-picking. After I started writing about this, I was absolutely deluged with messages from students at universities up and down the country who'd experienced similar things and felt uncomfortable or pressured. And there was also a lot of evidence in what we were hearing to suggest that this kind of sexual objectification carried over beyond Freshers Week, beyond the initiations and the rituals. A huge number of students mentioned specific competitions and point systems for sleeping with freshers, particularly female freshers, often coming from the older students who were supposed to be there to look after them and help them settle in. One student described how at their student union there was an ad up on the wall that was looking for people to help out with Freshers Week. It was a cartoon of a vulnerable looking girl with the slogan, want to feel a little fresher. Another girl said, I remember when I was a fresher, I heard a couple of male students discussing a point system for sleeping with female freshers while in the laundry room. Another girl described a night where female freshers had to dress up as foxes, male freshers had to dress up as hounds, and the second and third year boys dressed as huntsmen. The idea was that the hounds had to catch their huntsman, a fox. Another student said, at my university, the Freshers' Week crew are designed to help new students, but they get points for scoring with freshers, especially virgins. We heard about point scoring systems where people got bonus points if they took the girl's virginity or brought her knickers in. One student said it was called seal clubbing at her university. At another, it was called sharking. At another, it was simply called fuck a fresh fresher. It seemed to be such a widely acknowledged practice that there were these colloquial names for it at different universities. And the more you hear about this, the less harmless it sounds and the more it sounds like part of something wider. As one student pointed out when she wrote to us about a chant that her male peers had at university that was about sluts, whores and slags, these are the world leaders, the CEOs and the politicians of tomorrow. These are the attitudes about women and their place that are being drummed into them from the very first week of university. And it's important to say that these things do sometimes happen to boys too. We had one entry from a fresher man who was forced to watch porn in his underwear while a fresher woman was told to sit on his lap to see if he got an erection. But in the main, the stories, including the ones from men that came in because they were talking about what had happened to their female peers, seemed to suggest that this sexualized aspect and often this undercurrent of misogyny of kind of making the girls do things that were somehow embarrassing or degrading focused much more on women and that the men's initiation seemed more to focus on things like drinking excessive amounts of alcohol or having to eat disgusting combinations of food. 
So these, again, are not isolated incidents. Many of you will probably know that in the last year alone, we've seen events using the slogan, fuck me, I'm a fresher, promoted at more than one university in the UK. Students have reported being groped, grabbed, pursued, and propositioned as part of Freshers Week events. We've seen a Freshers Week poster at one university that had a picture on it of a T-shirt with the words, last night I was raping a woman and she cried. We've seen students who've been banned for playing a game called It's Not Rape If. The Leeds club night Freshers Violation, which was advertised on YouTube using a video of a male fresher being asked what he was going to do at Freshers Violation and saying that he was going to rape a female fresher. We've seen the video of lads on the bus joking and laughing about sexual assault and about miscarriages, and the boys who went out in casual rape t-shirts, all in the last year alone. So why does all this matter? What's the big deal? Well, it matters because, according to a survey by the National Union of Students, which looks specifically at female students' experiences whilst at university, one in seven experienced a serious physical or sexual assault, 12% were stalked, and 68% were victims of sexual harassment. It also matters because most perpetrators were known to the victims, and most perpetrators were students. And it matters more than ever because only 4% of the female students who were seriously sexually assaulted reported it to their academic institution, and only 10% felt able to report it to the police. And when they were giving the reasons for these low reporting rates, they were asked, why didn't you feel able to report what happened? 50% 50 said that they didn't report it because they were ashamed or embarrassed, and 43% because they thought they would be blamed for what happened. So suddenly, importantly, this is where we come back to the Freshers' Week jokes and the initiations and the slag, slut, ho, slapper labels, the pressure on female students to dress in a certain way, often by university-affiliated knights, the ideas they're pressured to perpetuate, the banterous games about chasing female students down, hunting them, stripping their bras. And then you look at the statistic that nearly 100% of all students who didn't report a sexual assault were either ashamed or thought they'd be blamed. And of course it's not a simple case of cause and effect. Of course it's not to suggest that a male student will go to one of these events and suddenly go out and rape or sexually assault a female peer. It's more complex than that. It's a case of saying, against this backdrop, what do we do? Given that we're dealing with a culture in which so many female students are experiencing sexual harassment and assault, what would be useful? Given that we're dealing with a culture in which female students feel unable to report and sexual assault isn't taken seriously, how might these kinds of stereotypes be contributing to that problem and to that wider culture? And talking about culture, you might have heard the term rape culture used recently. It's used to describe a culture in which rape and sexual violence are common and in which prevalent attitudes, norms, practices and media normalise, excuse, tolerate or even condone rape. And online, this frequently focuses on students and young women, thanks to websites like Unilad, The Lad Bible, and Confessions of a Uni Student. I'm talking about entire websites, where even though most of the articles are about women, you won't see a single female name, because they're replaced with wenches, hoes, clunge, skank, sloppy seconds, pussy tramp, chick, bird, milf, slut, and gash. They're part of a growing culture in which the sexual targeting of female students as prey is actively encouraged, even when it verges on sexual assault. It's an atmosphere in which victims are silenced and perpetrators encouraged to see crimes merely as banter, just part of being a lad. These are websites with articles saying things like, 85% of rape cases go unreported. That seems to be fairly good odds. Websites which describe a female student who has said that she doesn't want to sleep with you as an obstacle course, just a game to get around. Websites where posters talking about smashing a virgin and having bloodstains to prove it. And when criticised, these sites, in their own words, tend to say, get a fucking grip, we're having a bit of harmless banter. A recent post that appeared on one of their Facebook pages describes a graphic incident of a man knocking a woman clean out with one smack and leaving her for dead on the side of the road. And yet this word banter, this cloak of irony, is being used to excuse mainstream horrific sexism, the normalisation and belittling of rape and domestic violence. And it's a very clever way of silencing, because if something's a joke, it's very hard to stand up to. If you object to something and it's just a joke, then you're being uptight. The joke's on you. You just don't have a sense of humour. And the implication is that if something's a joke, everybody gets it except you. 
It isolates victims. It makes it much harder to stand up to. One female student who wrote to me said, I don't find it funny. These pages are not pages for jokes. There are no punchlines. They're not sexist jokes. They're just displays of sexism, displays of misogyny. I find it threatening. I find it terrifying. This is not banter. She asked to remain anonymous because she said, I'm afraid of these people. I'm afraid that these attitudes that we thought were ebbing away are coming back with force. I'm afraid that by taking a stand against pages like this, I will mark myself as a target. And again, these aren't isolated incidents. The Imperial College newspaper Thelix printed a joke article which provided male students with a recipe for the date rape drug Rehypnol because they said it was a foolproof way to have sex on Valentine's Day for cheaper than the price of a hooker. An Exeter University Society printed a shag mag in which it speculated about how many calories male students could burn by stripping female students naked without their consent. At one university, the lacrosse team were given rules that stated, members don't date, that's what rape is for. At another university, the men's hockey team held an event where the theme was rape victims. And it isn't just something that happens in clubs or when students go out. It's something that's beginning to become pervasive in all aspects of the academic experience. You see pages like this on Facebook, where girls completely unwittingly in the, university doing their, in the university library doing their work find that their pictures appear later on on Facebook. We heard from one girl who said that there was a group of lads at her university that started an anonymous page where they talked about girls who were eating at the canteen. But she said because they didn't know who the people were that were doing it, she had a choice to make between not eating, not going to the canteen, or risking that her picture would end up on Facebook with people talking about coming all over her breasts. Um, and on Facebook as well, this banter about abuse and violence and at other places online has also proliferated in recent years. And these next slides may be very distressing, so they come with a trigger warning for domestic violence and sexual assault if you feel that you need to look away. And again, this is all part of the normalization of a society in which we joke about rape, a society in which sexual assault is just something to laugh about, just banter, just part of being a lad. And against that backdrop, we get stories like these. A male student at university with me outright told me I was having sex with him that night. He was calling me a slag, a slut, and a whore. He straddled himself across my legs and started pinning me against the seat, forcing kisses on me and saying, now I've got you. Another student said, I was raped in my second year of university. I had some great support from my family and some great therapy. I thought this was the worst part, but when I felt safe enough to tell my friends, the question started. Was I drunk? Was I dressed sluttily? Did I know him? Had I led him on? And in fact, what happens is that boundaries begin to become so blurred that people aren't even aware of what they have the right to be protected from. I often speak in universities all up and down the UK, and I have a slide which just simply says the definition of sexual assault under UK law, which is that if somebody touches you anywhere on your body and the touching is sexual, you don't consent, and they don't reasonably believe that you consent, then it's a form of sexual assault. But when I talk about it in universities, young women come up to me afterwards saying, that can't be sexual assault because it's normal. That can't be sexual assault because it's just what happens when I go out with my friends because there's a massive gap between what people are protected from under the law and what society is telling women, particularly young women, particularly at university, is just part of life and just something that they ought to be putting up with. But we can say no, we can stand up, and we can shout back. We have to start now. No means no. It doesn't matter what you're wearing or where you are or who you've had sex with in the past or whether you've been flirting. It doesn't matter if it's someone you know, if it's late at night or if you're drunk. Nobody has the right to touch you sexually without your consent. So what can you do to play your part? The important thing is that we need a cultural shift in attitudes, in the way that we perceive women, and everybody can be a part of that. We can petition student unions and clubs to take a zero-tolerance policy towards sexual harassment and groping. We can speak up about consent and try to offset some of these normalized assumptions. We can support students who are sexually assaulted to feel able to report it if they want to. We can all play a part in influencing these social norms and the culture around us, not letting the small stuff slide, because it's those minor incidents that contribute to the same attitudes about women that lead to the bigger issues happening. Calling women sluts and slags, giving them marks out of 10, dehumanizes them. Joking about rape and assault normalizes it. So we have to speak up. 
and our voices the loudest when we raise them together. Thank you.